Toledo Mudheads were scouting this uh, third baseman and they offered him a contract and they sent him a note saying, if you know any good pitchers you can recommend, let us know. So he signed his contract and sent back a letter said, the best pitcher in Wisconsin is Addie Joss. So the Mudhens, without even seeing him, didn't even know who he was. On this recommendation, they sent Addie a contract for $75 a month if he made good. And of course, Addie jumped at that because it was a big step up. Uh, he pitched his first game here in uh, April of 1900. Uh, won that one. And uh, an interesting side note, I think, is that uh, Lillian Shinover was a young lady in the crowd that day. and. Just a little over two years later, she became his wife. And following with that, he made uh, Toledo his home. And he was very successful. He won 44 games in the, in the two seasons he was here. Toledo is the home of Roger Bresnahan, who's Toledo's only native son who's in the Hall of Fame. And he was a contemporary of, uh, of Addie's, uh, but played in the National League. But they were apparently pretty good friends, and in 1903, in the fall, Roger Bresnahan and Eddie Joss made an offer to Strobel to buy the Mud Hens, uh, which was turned down. Strobel was asking $12,000 for the club. They offered 10. Uh, they just, Charlie wouldn't take it, so uh, they were out of the ownership. But interestingly, had that offer been accepted, and both players would have sought their release to come to Toledo and manage and run and play for the club. Uh, we likely would not be talking about Eddie Joss today. He was still a property of the Mudheads in 1902. Charles Strobel was the owner. And even though a lot of teams had made offers for Eddie for cash, as high as $3,000 or more, Strobel wouldn't sell them because whenever he pitched, the grandstand was filled and he made more money. Cleveland approached him quietly and said, come with us, we'll protect you, and don't worry about it, we'll fix it. So he basically jumped his contract, so to speak, with Toledo and went to Cleveland. Charlie uh, thought, thought he had him under contract, but uh, in fact, he said, if uh, he goes to Cleveland, I'll see that he goes to the penitentiary. Uh, but he did go to Cleveland and did not go to the penitentiary, so Charlie must not have had an ironclad contract with him. His very first game in 1902 against St. Louis, he nearly had a no-hitter. And it may have actually been as the one hit was a disputed pop fly to right field. At that time, there was only one umpire. And he stayed behind home plate, didn't have a good view of it. And apparently the Cleveland players had been giving him a hard time during the series, so he wasn't about to give him a break. The right fielder seemed to have caught the ball off his shoe tops, but the ump ruled he trapped it and it was a base hit. And then Addy went on, that was the only hit he gave up in his first start. So he really probably had a no hitter in his very first start in baseball, which I don't think anyone has ever been able to do that. The team offered him a $500 bonus if he could win 20 games. He got uh, number 20 on his last start. I'm sure he had some savings, he used the bonus, and he got his house on Fulton Street. Well, during his years here, uh, he uh, became involved with the Masons. He, he was a 32nd degree Mason. He did some sports writing. Uh, he wrote extensively for the Toledo Newsbee. The Cleveland Press carried some of his work, as did the, uh, the Sporting News. They had two children. Uh, 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 Ruth. Ruth was the uh, second born, born about uh, I think four or five years after no after Norman, their son. So he spent a good deal of time, uh, obviously not during the season, but in the off season with his family, and he was noted to be a family man. Uh, did his Masonic work. Uh, it seemed like he was uh, a solid family type giving man. This was October second. 1908 at League Park, the Indians, or rather the Naps, were playing the White Sox. And there were only two games with them, and three with St. Louis, and that would end the season. St. Louis was doing poorly. It seemed if you got by these two games with the White Sox, you go to St. Louis, you could probably sweep and you'd win the pennant. Well, the White Sox weren't conceding anything. They had Ed Walsh pitching on that Friday. Walsh would win 40 games that year, which is unheard of. That's Most pitchers don't even get 40 starts, even close. But Walsh was sensational. And of course, Cleveland countered with Addie Joss, their best pitcher, one of the best in baseball. Everybody knew 
this was going to be a pitcher's battle. But nobody expected to see a one nothing win from the Naps, where Walsh strikes out 15 guys and Josh throws a perfect game. He retires 27 guys in a row in front of 10,000 people at Lee Park, which was a huge crowd for Friday afternoon. And Josh just mowed the guys down. There was nothing even close to a hit. And in the ninth inning, the drama really came when the White Sox manager, Fielder Jones, sent up three straight pinch hitters to try and at least get somebody on base. But Josh was equal to the task. He got the first guy out, he struck out the second, the last hitter grounded out to third to Bill Bradley, who threw him out, and there was a perfect game. And again, this was, everything was on the line, and Joss managed to do it with just one run. He just mowed down the White Sox, and I think one of the best games ever pitched in view of the circumstances. With everything to lose, he came through with the game of his life and one of the great games in, in the history of baseball. He would pass out in spring training in uh, Tennessee, I believe, at the, at the time they were in Chattanooga. He was very sick, he couldn't breathe well. They put him on a train and sent him home to Toledo. The doctor believed it was pleurisy and that with bed rest and care, it might take a month or so, but he would be okay. But he didn't get better, he got worse. So he called the Indian team physician to come to Toledo. He drew some blood from Addie's spine and by looking at it, he knew he had contracted tubercular meningitis. Within days, Addie was going to pass away. The public was invited to come. His body was bought from home, where it was uh, viewed at home. And 5,000 people walked by that beer in two hours to, to pay their last respects to Addie. The entire Naps team was there. They had refused to play their game against the Tigers. And there was going to be a forfeit, but uh, Charles Summers, the Cleveland owner, put some pressure on Van Johnson, the league president, and Johnson relented, allowed the players to uh, skip the game and go to the funeral. And a number of Tigers went to the funeral as well. At the time of Addie's death, uh, Cy Young and Addie Joss were teammates. Uh, like the rest of the NAP squad, Cy Young came to the funeral and escorted uh, Addie's, Addie's mother for the day. Billy Sunday, the evangelist uh, who was formerly a ball player and preached a funeral sermon said of Addie, Addie Joss was truly one of the great athletes of the world. His noble character and many manly qualities added a luster to the game. The presence of this distinguished gathering is a splendid tribute to his worth. Then the uh, body was taken to the cemetery and uh, put in a vault for, for burial a bit later on, where he still is at Woodlawn Cemetery, which he, where he remains. But Charles Summers, the owner, wanted to do something for Addy to raise money for his widow. So he was the inst instigator behind it. Most of the city fell in line. So it really became a grassroots movement. Fans got involved, friends, everybody. They found an off day where nobody was playing, and they uh, decided to book that day with approval from Van Johnson in July, and that way they could have an all-star team of players from all around the American League. And uh, Most of the guys agreed to play and came there. It was an unbelievable who's who. Ty Cobb was there with, with Sam Crawford. Walter Johnson was there pitching. Trish Speaker came to play in the ball game. Just a host of people came there. They all wanted to be involved. There were more players volunteered than they could use. And supposedly a few guys from the National League wired Charles Summers and said they'd be glad to play too. But he wired back, we're just keeping it to the American League. Ty Cobb was just wonderful about the whole thing. He contributed $100 to the fund, which was more than most of the owners kicked in. He also sent a huge display of flowers to Lillian Joss, and he wired the American League office, I'm playing in the game, you don't have to invite me, I'm coming. And then they asked him, could we mention this in the papers? The cop initially said, no, I don't want any publicity about it, but they explained it would probably help attendance, so Koch said, sure, okay. So he came even though his uniform and his equipment was lost on the trip, he wore a Cleveland uniform. And I'm sure people looked at that and said, wow, what things could have been if he really was a Cleveland Nap? Addy was one of the dominant pitchers of his era. Had there been all-star teams, he would have made one every single year. The big thing was the rule that you had to play 10 years minimum 
to be considered. I think what pushed him over the top was the death of Roberto Clemente. They wanted to put Roberto in right away. So they were talking about, well, waiving rules about eligibility, why don't we look at players who didn't play 10 full seasons? And that was agreed to, and the name that came up immediately was Addie Joss, who had played the nine seasons. He went in in 1978.